Hi, Misha here, and I know we've been doing a lot of more modern guns, and it's a lot of fun. They're more shootable, especially in our damp climate, but as many know they've been following the channel for a long time, I love old bolt actions. Unfortunately, I really don't have anything new to show you, but since we did recover the British short magazine, Lee Enfield, of World War I and World War II fame, I thought, why not go back and do a dedicated video on the original Lee Metford and the first Lee Enfields and kind of discuss what is a very interesting story. So here are my three early Lees. We've got the long Lee up top here. And then we have a cavalry carbine here. And then finally, one of the last types made, the New Zealand carbine, very similar to the Royal Irish Constabulary carbine. All are chambered for 303, although these were intended to fire the original 215 grain round nose bullet, Mark II, Mark III, Mark IV, up to about Mark VI. Mark VII would be when the Spitzer was introduced, and these really weren't intended to fire that round. But that's kind of getting ahead of things. Let's go back to, really, 1880. Even though this is a Lee Enfield Mark I, externally it looks identical, really, to a late Lee Metford. Going back in time, of course, Britain wanted a new repeating, i.e. magazine-fed, bolt action, of course, new black powder rifle to replace the uh, Martini, Henry, and others. And so work began at the Royal Small Arms Factory in Field around 1880-1881. And by 1884, we had some prototypes going. But of course, in 1886, France would screw everything up with black powder by introducing smokeless. But by this point, Britain had over half a decade of resources put into their rifle, and so they kind of wanted to make do with what they already had, not abandon their research. This was not uncommon. A lot of nations were kind of caught in an interesting period. The rifle had three principal contributors. James Paris Lee made the bolt system and the unique, for the time, detaching magazine. William Metford made an equally unique rifling system. It was a seven groove. It was a shallow rounded pattern, really an early version of polygonal rifling. And this was a great idea for black powder, roughly 30 caliber. It would be easy to clean, and it would wear less with the slower black powder. It really was a good idea, plus it was actually quite accurate. And our final gentleman was uh, Joseph Speed. He put a lot of finishing touches on. He worked on the sights, the early style at least, the magazine feed cut off, and this kind of unique dust cover on top of the action. So these three gentlemen really contributed, and they had a good black powder rifle. Unfortunately, it would become a smokeless powder using cordite. And it would actually be adapted reasonably well, and adopted in December of 1888 as the Lee Metford Mark I. Lee's bolt system was actually very strong for black powder, which meant that it was adequate for the early smokeless. As we know today, it's quite famous for this rear locking system. The bolt only has to travel the distance of the cartridge itself, not the cartridge plus lugs, 
It also has only a 60 degree throw to turn it down versus 80 or 90 on other guns. And it is cock on close as you see here. I don't like dry firing this, so I'll use it forward. And it worked well. This has contributed to the infield's reputation for very quick firing. The downside to this rear locking system, well, it's not as strong, and it allows for bending and flexing of the bolt. We see this with the early Schmidt Rubens too. But again, for early smokeless, it worked. Interestingly, the first Mark I Lee Metfords had a receiver mounted safety lever not dissimilar to what we saw on the SMLE. And while they did have an attaching magazine, it wasn't 10 rounds, it was actually 8 because it would come up to a kind of a single feed. It's a different system. And it was about 49 and a half inches overall. It had a different style of early pattern sights, essentially black powder sights. Quickly tried to modify for smokeless. It had a barrel about 30 and a quarter inches long. And it had a clearing rod under the barrel. Really something mostly held over from its black powder days. It still had a storage compartment in the stock for cleaning rope and oiler and what have you. Had uh, two sling swivels plus a front swivel. And uh, yeah, pretty much looks like this. A turned down bolt handle. Something quite interesting for the day and time. It had a short upper hand guard. No front upper. No protected sight. And these dial sights or volley sights were there from the very get-go. Talk more about those in a minute. As was, of course, the magazine feed cut off because from the beginning, the powers that be used to single shot guns. They just weren't sure giving eight rounds was a good idea. They thought soldiers might blow through them quite quickly. Well, the initial Lee Metford would stay in production briefly, but in January, the very beginning of January, 1892, the Lee Metford Mark I Star would appear. This version would have two principal changes. One, they would go to this type of sight. The rifle was expected to have a maximum range of at least 1,800 yards. Yeah, well, again, this is early days of black, uh, excuse me, smokeless powder. They didn't know, really, the capabilities. And they would do away with the receiver-mounted safety. The Mark I Star would not have really any kind of safety at all, aside from the exposed cocking piece and the uh, one located between the two ears of the conscript. Of course, it did have the feed cutoff, which normally would remain on, i.e. in the end position, unless the uh, squad sergeant or other rise commander ordered them to go to the magazine. Interestingly, the Mark I Star was produced very briefly, because just two weeks later, still in January 1892, the Mark II would be introduced. And that's actually where we find our updated pattern of magazine here from, again, James Paris Lee. This is the 10 round mag we're more familiar with. Essentially what he did is make it into a double stack, double feed. Although these still needed to be fitted to their guns and they were still chained to their guns because not only were they worried about soldiers losing the ammo by firing it too quickly they also worried about losing the mags too something that was kind of borne out in russia decades later with the svt-40 even though this is chained here the gun had no provision for chargers or stripper clips they were expected to be fed in, not by detaching the magazine. Sorry, I'm trying to get my, make my chain crimped up. But loading them from the top. That's actually why two magazines were issued, and the spare was kept loaded in a pocket for, you know, 
emergency situations. And the Mark II Lee Medford would kind of remain the pattern for a while. But at this point, we just have this long infantry rifle. What about cavalry? We're still very much on horseback. Artillery, signal corps, what have you. They would have to wait a couple of years. In 1894, the MLC Lee Metford Carbine Mark I would be introduced, and this is an actual Lee Metford. Anyone who knows the channel knows that, yeah, picked it up years ago. So it still has the, we'll call it polygonal rifling, although that's not exactly correct before anyone ats me, but it gives the idea of the rounded shallowness. And this has roughly a 10 inch shorter barrel, so a little over 20 inches. Subsequently, it is also shorter and lighter. And it has no provision for a bayonet. Still has a spot for a clearing rod under the barrel. Doesn't really have sling swivels as such either. Does have a storage compartment for cleaning gear in the butt. And you'll notice this protector over the rear sight. That's because they did everything they could to knock down sharp square edges so it would not snag because these were primarily carried in kind of a saddle holster or bucket. Starting at the front, notice how the front cap is slimmed down. It does have a protected front sight, first one, and it has a forward handguard, although not a rear. We still have the tusk cover. We still have the feed cutoff. We have a new pattern of bolt handle that's actually severely bent in, almost flush, and the front or facing edge is chopped down to make it a semicircle, again, to try to save on weight. Notice on this side, we do have provision for a strap here. That's so something can be attached to pull it out of a holster, buckle, scabbard, whatever. And we have a short six round mag Although this is the newer double stack, double feed pattern. I'm going to sit you doing this for a second because it bounces out and gets a little stuck on this one. There we go. Again, just to make it a little easier for cavalry to use, it's still chained to the gun. What have you. These were expected to achieve ranges out to about 1,200 yards, so less than the rifle, but pretty optimistic considering the relatively short sight radius and small sights. We do have one thing here of importance. The cavalry carbine was the first to introduce this safety mounted on the cocking piece of the bolt. And note that it does not have the dial sights, i.e. volley sights. See? So at least they understood that really wasn't a practical thing. Plus, they would have snagged and it just wasn't worth it. And this is actually a much slimmer, trimmer, and lighter carbine. And at first, it was well received. So we have a long rifle for the infantry and a short like carbine for cavalry, artillery, everyone else. So, yeah, by 1895, things are looking up. Or at least they should be. Here they are lined up. So you can see, yeah, the carbine is uh, considerably shorter. In April of 1895, we would get the final version of the Metford rifle, the Mark II Star. I guess they like this safety notion. Remember, the last couple of versions of this had no safety. So with the Mark II Star, Lee Metford, they put the safety on the bolt. But, again, this would not be in frontline service for very long. In November 1895, the Lee Enfield 
MLE Mark I would be introduced. So by 1896, the Lee Medford Long Rifle was out of production, very soon to be followed by the Lee Medford Carbine. So very few carbines were built over just a couple of year run, although there are some interesting variants. So why the change? Well, I bet many of you know, but hey, we're hanging out, right? Let's talk about it. That dang rifling. Metford's rifling was brilliant for black powder. In fact, with the Lee Speed series, produced by BSA and LSA, London's Moms, they continued usually to use the Metford pattern because it was considered very accurate. But what they quickly discovered, even before really getting into any major conflict, it eroded very quickly with the new smokeless powder ammunition. By this point, we're up to the 303 Mark III ball, which is still a, a round-nosed bullet, but it's kind of a semi-soft point. It has very thin jacket in front with the exposed lead core. We would also get to the Mark IV and Mark V, which were patently hollow points. Mm -hmm. Either way, they were putting a lot of stress. Now, we're not talking like they would burn out in a thousand rounds. We're not. This was this wasn't the the Winchester eighteen ninety five Lee Navy. Those six millimeter guns just were gone. But five six thousand rounds, you would start to see major degradation of the Medford rifling. So, at Lee Enfield, they set to work, and like I said, in November of eighteen ninety five, they introduced this gun. The change was the rifling. They went to a square pattern with very deep grooves. And while this would be more difficult to clean and not as accurate necessarily, it did last quite a bit longer. Now we're not talking 20,000 rounds or 30, uh, roughly 10 up to 12 maybe. So it had roughly twice the life of a Lee Metford. For a civilian shooter, 6,000 rounds is perfectly acceptable. For a military, you can understand how they could get up to 10,000 relatively quickly in training. So, the Mark I infield here would replace the Metford and go into mass production. There would be one variant of this called the Mark I Star, introduced in 1899, and it had the cleaning rod or clearing rod removed. It also had somewhat updated sights. That's because the woes of the Long Lee were not over yet. Beginning in 1899, what we know today is the Second Boer War began, where in southern Africa, British troops with their new 303s went up against the Afrikaans, the Boers, with the Orange Free State, primarily armed with guns like this. The 7mm Mauser, often one of the newest variants, the 1895 Chilean, although some had the older 1893. This was one of the first times the Mauser pattern really made a name for itself. And the British didn't really like what they found. Now first off, a lot of them still had the older Lee Metfords. Even the ones who came in with the newer Lee Enfields, they found that the rear sights were not properly calibrated for the current ammunition. So when they shot at, at any kind of distance, they were off, way off. 18 inches or more off at just 100 or 200 yards. So during that war, <laughs> they had to make a running change and send over new rear sights. There were also complaints that this cavalry carbine, while short and light, was just not giving them range because this was a war of ranges and accuracy. And that's where 7mm here and the Mauser 1895 really shined. The 7x57 cartridge is already known for being very flat shooting. 
This rifle has a very smooth bolt, even though it's a straight bolt handle. And even though it only holds five rounds versus 10 of the infield, it could be and was designed to be topped off by stripper clips, what the British call chargers. So fewer rounds in the gun, but that gave it a major advantage. So kind of the same lesson America would learn in Cuba during the Spanish-American War with their Craig Jorgensen's. The infield, even with the corrected barrel and sights, was a mixed bag at best. And the Mauser, while part of it was, you know, the, the grass is always green on the other side, a lot in the British military and the hierarchy really felt this was a good gun. And because the cavalry carbine wasn't doing what was needed, a lot of them were replaced quite quickly with long rifles, believe it or not. They'd rather have the bulk and, and slight cumbersomeness of this with the range and extra ammo it afforded. So even the, as we call the infield version of the carbine, the LEC, the infield carbine, Mark I. There would also be a Mark I star that did not have the rod under the barrel, introduced in 1889 as well. Would kind of, yeah. One other final thing that kind of put a wrinkle in Britain's plans. In 1899, the Hague Convention outlawed by the rules of war, the laws, expanding bullets, i.e. hollow points, that kind of thing. That forced Britain to retire the Mark III, Mark IV, and Mark V, and introduce the Mark VI by 1904. And the Mark VI, it was still trying to be a little bit of a soft point, soft tip with a thinner jacket, but not like the Mark III, and it was still a round nose bullet over 200 grains. Again, we'd have to wait till 1910 for the Spitzer to come along. But I think you see the seeds here with what happened there for the short magazine Lee Enfield, the universal short rifle, replacing both the cavalry and the long. And of course the P-13 that led to the P-14, which is a complete abandonment of the James Paris Lee's system in favor of something very, very Mauser-like. Again, very similar to what America did with the 1903 Springfield. So the Boer War was very influential on the infield's path. In fact, by 1901, the original Longley and Carbine's fate was really sealed. They were going to be retired and replaced, and that's kind of where we picked up with our SMLE video last time. But of course, I did have one final rifle to show you here, and there is one kind of final major chapter before this gets put to bed. The Kiwi Carbine, the New Zealand Carbine. In 1901, a thousand of these were ordered, especially from Britain, and delivered, and then a second order for 500 was placed in 1903, and then between 1904 and 1906, a few more were built kind of from leftover parts, just because. You can see the Mark I style end cap here with no hole for a rod. And this bayonet lug is kind of the key difference. Of course, the original rifle took a bayonet. It was the pattern 1888, really based on the 1884. And I do have one around here somewhere. I didn't bring it out for this video. Sorry, but that was the major difference. The New Zealanders wanted the ability to mount a bayonet on a carbine because these were more for colonial use, rat control, police use, use in the brush. They just, they just wanted one. So what they did, they took the Lee carbine action and they plugged in a martini infield 303 barrel, which is thicker 
It does have protected front sight, but it's a little different style protector. And it mounts the bayonet. We have another change here with sling swivels because that was something else they wanted. We have more of a rifle style rear swivel here and we have a front swivel here. Note that it does not have the stacking lug or swivel and note that it does have the upper handguard here that ends at the sight. Also that it still retains the chained on six round mag dust cover but no volley sights and the flat bolt and mag cutoff yeah these are meant more for either people on foot they weren't really meant for horseback they just they wanted a, a stabby thing so under 2000 were built 1500 for the official contract plus you know a few more over the years it's interesting because these were purpose built and really the last official fully built came out of the factory this way pattern of original Lee. Now of course the very similar Royus, Roy, Royus, there we go, Royal Irish Constabulary Carbine, RIC, Rick, would appear in 1904. These were refurbished, reconditioned Lee Metford and some Lee Enfield carbines also given a bayonet lug. They essentially modified the forearm and they added a bit of a ring on the end of the barrel so the bayonet would fit properly. Without it, the barrel's too thin, it would uh, rattle around. Although I should say the barrel on the cavalry carbine is too thin. They shaved it down a bit to save weight again. And uh, the RIC guns can be interesting because they were repurposed, so what they were originally, a little different. And they would assemble about 11,200 of those over about a decade, really only ending in 1914 with the onset of the Great War, World War I. This would also be the time when the commercial Lee Speed series, like I said earlier, which mostly continued to use the Lee Metford rifling because it was for more sports shooters, would end. Interestingly, too, not all Lee Speeds were in 303. Some were in 315, which was basically 8mm man liquor, modified a bit, because even at the dawn of the 20th century, some places in the world disallowed military calibers, so that was kind of a way around it. We see this today in Europe, and uh, so it's a long-standing thing. So these were really the last ones. It is a little heavier than the cavalry and actually just a smidgen longer because of the barrel. But it's not a short rifle. It's definitely a carbine, but getting there. And finally, around 1906, running for a few years, some of the older Lee Metfords and Lee Enfields were converted to charger loading variants, much like that SMLE Mark I we saw in the last video. And that would mostly be done between that time and 1910, by which point we started to see the Mark VII Spitzer round. And while there were some long leaves and even a few carbines still knocking about in 1914, because they needed the older round nose bullets, once those ran out, they were of little use, so they were retired for training and drill and sent to school. Some of them were converted to 22s which is another variant I covered in a past video. The Longley, the original, really did get a maligned reputation because of the Boer War and a few other little brush wars in the early 20th century. Meanwhile, the Mauser, especially when the 1898 came out, really made a name for itself. So the writing was basically on the wall that this was going to be replaced. Perhaps the SMLE Mark I would be the final version, or maybe the Mark III. But the plan was to go to a new cartridge, which would be rimless, higher velocity, with a pattern 1913, P13, based on a Mauser action, not a Lee action. It was World War I that saved this system and made it one of the most long-lived military rifles in human history and proved that while 303 wasn't perfect, 
it was good enough. It made this an iconic British weapon. And it all began here. And I love these early variants because they really show you all the changes. And they actually built these in quite large numbers. Early ones, over 300,000. Later variants, about 600,000. So you're looking at just around a million were built, including everything, between 1888 and the last ones maybe coming out using up parts around 1904, 1905. So a reasonably long production run. They, of course, came out of uh, the Burrell Small Arms Factory Enfield, Birmingham, BSA, London, LSA, which were, was actually known for producing very nice sporter-grade versions. But they were not produced abroad, although there was the Indian pattern, the IP, which was based on these. But they weren't really made in, for example, Australia or Canada. So primarily British, with some work done at Ishapur as well on that uh, late IP variant, or early SMLE if you prefer. But what really doomed this was the fact that it wasn't made for the Spitzer cartridge, the less than optimal sights, the fact that they weren't designed to feed from chargers, and that it was kind of stuck in the 19th century notion of, you know, nearly three foot long infantry rifle and under two foot long cavalry carbine. The 20th century proved that the short rifle concept was really the way to go with bolt guns, especially with smokeless powder. The long barrel is kind of a holdover from black powder. When the more length you got was, the, was better. But when you get to smokeless, depending on the cartridge itself, you get to a point and then there's no really advantage to a longer barrel aside from more of a sight radius. But other than that, not much. And even that's kind of a limited use on a battlefield. So they really discovered that with this cartridge, 24, 25 inches, it maxed out. There was really absolutely no need for 30 inches except again sight radius and also I guess bayonet fighting can make it advantageous. Likewise, cavalry carbines, while neat, they weren't as all-purpose as they would like and just had compromises. Plus, with two guns in the system, you have to have two different types of parts. You go to a short rifle, you have one gun, so all the parts are the same. Makes work in the field, especially when you have a major war like World War I on your hands. I don't know. They just felt like uh, revisiting this. Hope this was uh, enjoyable to some. I don't want to not have bolt actions on this channel at all. Although, I admit, doing the modern stuff gets us out to the range. I would not want to shoot any of these. I don't have any round nose 303. And uh, they're all old enough that, you know what? They're one of those guns, kind of like my Murata's in the collection, that are just, they're, they're retired at this point. If you want to shoot yours, that's great. Me, if I want to shoot an infield, I'll just shoot a newer Mark III or something. Or maybe a number four. But, yeah, I have these for collecting purposes. And just because I find them mechanically very interesting. So what do you think? Do you like them? Do you see the differences between this and the later versions? Even if you go to the number five, the jungle carbine as they call it. It's still essentially the same Lee system, though. And while they updated the magazine, that too is essentially the same. Kind of interesting. Even the buttstock didn't change a whole lot. Anywho, appreciate you hanging out with me today. As always, if you could, please like, share, subscribe, drop a comment. And if you'd really like to help support the channel as we move into the holiday season, any help over on Patreon is much appreciated, much obliged. But if you can't, understand too. This is Misha. Catch you very soon. Next time.